Okay. So we'll start it with a case. I always like case-based uh, rounds. And uh, here's what I've got. So a uh, 69-year-old female presents with eight hours of intermittent retrosternal chest pain and nausea. Uh, they come in waves lasting about uh, three, four minutes at a time. And she's, you know, typical cardiovascular risk factors, uh, overweight, uh, hypertension, diabetes, and a bit of renal insufficiency. Um, she comes in, uh, this is the note, uh, that her heart rate's 170 to 200 beats per minute, and then gets dizzy. And this is what we have for a rhythm strip here. Uh, so remember, she's almost 70 years old. So uh, what we're talking about here does not only apply to young people, uh, she is Dutch, uh, so it doesn't only apply to, it applies to all uh, ethnic groups. And you can see here uh, a nice strip of polymorphic VT going into ventricular fibrillation. Uh, you can notice on the top strip here, uh, the coupling interval is, is pretty early and tight. It's not a late coupled PVC that sets this off. It's rather early coupled here, a little later coupled here, uh, but very rapidly into ventricular fibrillation. Uh, in, in both cases. Now, 69-year-old hypertensive diabetic, there's her ECG, of course. Uh, you know, first thing people think about is, is this an acute myocardial infarction, right? When you see these V1, V2, V3, but you'd also see there's elevation in two, three, ADF. Um, you know, so that that's odd, right? You know, we really should, shouldn't see acute anterior inferior infarction because if you have a blockage of your LAD and your RCA at the same time, or your LAD and your circuit at the same time, you're usually not in very good shape, right? You're usually in shock or dead. So uh, it's not uh, something we would see commonly, uh, you know, so that was the concern, uh, but that's also what we see. So she's investigated, she has a normal echo, normal coronary angiogram, and keeps going in and out of ventricular fibrillation in the unit. And we can see here, Again, it looks like she's got inferior Q waves and, and, and big time ST elevation, uh, but you can see it's, it's dynamic and it goes up and down. And here's just another run here where you can see, looking focused here at the V1 and V2 strips, you can see this incomplete right bundle branch block with ST elevation. And then again, degenerating into these short little runs of polymorphic VT. So uh, this is about as wild a case. This is so not typical of Brigada. Uh, but we're going to go over uh, the typical nature of this uh, right now. So, you know, what is it? it it's, it's a condition uh, caused by a genetic variation in the sodium channel for the most part. There are other uh, channels that are abnormal, but the SCN5A channel is, is the most commonly involved. And to be clear, Brigada can present with the, you know, funny SG segments that we're going to review here in a minute and those type of ventricular arrhythmias, but it also can present with AV blocks of any flavor, first, second, or third degree, atrial fibrillation, other atrial arrhythmias like atrial flutter, uh, and possibly even sinus node dysfunction. Uh, so, you know, Brigada is a very um, heterogeneous expression, right? So, and of course, the sodium channel is found in all of our tissues, right? It's one of the most conserved uh, proteins that we make across animal species. Uh, I have a big practice of genetic medicine and I'll see a lot of patients with Brigada who are identified uh, when they, you know, their children undergo screening for developmental delay, for example, or seizure disorder, and they order these broad panels that include the sodium channel. And, uh, you know, the next thing they do is find a, uh, an SCN5A or the uh, the sodium channel mutation and send them my way, even though they're asymptomatic. So these are the patterns that we have. So genetic abnormality, variable expression can cause any arrhythmia that you might see in your day-to-day -day work. Uh, so you have to be twigged in on it. What you will look for is the ECG pattern on the baseline ECG. So one of the good things about your lab is you do ECGs and you can see this sort of thing. So on the left-hand panel, you can see ST elevation, this coved ST elevation with an incomplete right bundle branch block, uh, J point elevation. Uh, you can see V1, V2, uh, you know, that is a type one pattern. And a type one pattern is the only pattern that's really prognostic. It's the only pattern that the actuaries at your insurance company will actually give you a rating for. Like this, you know, that one predicts bad outcomes or, you know, an increased risk of sudden cardiac death. 
The other two patterns where you see here, uh, uh, one millimeter elevation of ST or less with some incomplete right bundle branch pattern, that's a type two. And then this saddle back, I guess that's a Western saddle. Um, you can see where the ST segment is not really elevated at all, but you still see this little J point elevation, this little bump, and that's a type three. And the type two and type three uh, are non-prognostic. So, you know, I think one of the worst things we can do reading ECGs is, you know, to label people with this on their ECG as having Brigada because, you know, it's not prognostic. And now, you know, we've caused them a lot of grief on a routine uh, ECG coming for surgery, for example. And, you know, they have to go through a whole, uh, you know, cardiac clearance at that point they may have the implications for insurance or even for their job depending on what they do so um, I you know, urge people not to overcall these types of patterns and, and but on the other hand not to ignore uh, you know to treat these ones seriously because these are almost always important when you see that um, let me know if I'm going too fast okay so if you want to jump in just say listen stop let's break that down a little bit more because uh, uh, I take it for granted that I live and breathe this all the time, but that's your type one. You worry about type two and three. You may comment, so I won't say this person has Brigada syndrome. I may in a report say there's a type two Brigada ECG pattern. And that, you know, so that's not a diagnosis. That's not an illness. I've given the person that's just a pattern. And so I'll often describe a type two pattern and then maybe even elaborate that it's, you know, parenthetically that it's non-prognostic or something like that. Uh, I tend not to report type three patterns. I think, you know, if you did, you, you know, 2% of your ECGs or 1% of your ECGs are gonna be reported as type two or three patterns. So that's probably not helpful. Jeff, the other thing, yes, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff, a couple of quick questions. So, uh, am I muted? Mm -hmm. no, you can I hear you me. fine. Sorry, Jeff. Um, so, yeah. The, uh, the channels that are involved, are they the same uh, channels between type two and type three? Is there a, a difference in, in terms of? Uh, yeah, so it's all the sodium channel, typically the SCN5A gene, and it's all the same. Only about 50%, 5-0 of people with a clear-cut Brigada phenotype have an identifiable gene, okay? So 50% of these patients are gonna be gene negative. And that's just the nature of the beast. So you do not need a genetic mutation to call this disease. Uh, there are many factors, right? There's combinations of genes that can cause this. There's epigenetic factors. So you have a gene, but it's not, you know, it gets modified in its expression, for example. So there's a lot between um, compound heterozygous states and, and epigenetic phenomena that mean that half of the patients with Brigada do not have a gene. The other things to notice about this um, are um, two things. One, in terms of technologists, if you put, you know, we go fourth interspace, right, left for V1 and two. Uh, if you move that up in interspace, you will produce a type two and a type three pattern in many people, if not most people. Okay, so it's a very good point uh, to be very clear cut uh, where you're putting those V1 and V2 leads because you can create Brigada syndrome by putting things too high. Um, second, uh, you know, in patients who have had a cardiac arrest, for example, we purposely do a V1H and a V2H, you know, so high where we put those electrodes in the third interspace to kind of have a very, very sensitive screen for Brigada. If we don't see it up there, then uh, it probably doesn't exist. So, you know, the high electrode 12 lead ECG or 14 lead ECG is something we we do do routinely in the arrhythmia clinic uh, to look for, uh, you know, subtle signs of Brigada. Okay, so, and then the third is obviously the younger people have slightly different repolarization. And uh, again, in a young person, you know, the type two and three patterns are not rare in say eight year olds and things like this. So, you know, that's the first thing. It, it really depends on the location where you put the electrodes, how you diagnose this. The other thing, in addition to location dimension, you also have the time dimension. And these things are transient, right? So a person can have full-blown cardiac arrest like that lady's case I showed you, uh, and two weeks later, you just do a ECG and it looks normal. So like long QT, uh, Brigada and any channel disorder things, they can be fleeting and come and go. So if you have a high index of suspicion, 
Uh, for example, I have a patient who has cardiac arrest, clear cut for God, G negative. Um, I'll probably say to the son and the daughter, here's a requisition for five or even 10 ECGs, just randomly get these over the next couple of months and get a collection of ECGs, right? Because two or three out of those 10 may show Brigada and the other seven may not. And so you have to understand there's a temporal variability in the ECG patterns that we see. And then finally, there are triggers, both you know of the pattern itself, as well as the uh, cardiac arrest that might ensue. And you know the big triggers we have, uh, there are three big triggers and we warn our patients about them. Uh, first is fever. Uh, so, you know, anything that causes a fever can uh, make sodium channel current altered. And uh, we, we definitely teach our Brigada patients to take Tylenol aggressively in the setting of a fever. And, you know, we see people show up like this. I had one of my buddies from med school call me. He's a general surgeon in Oakville. And Miles calls me up and says, Jeff, I think this guy's got Brigada syndrome. I'm like, Miles, what the heck are you talking about, man? Like, you know, Brigada syndrome, you're a general surgeon. And he goes, yeah, he's, he's got these ST segments elevated in his chest leads, but it, he's got, he uh, doesn't really have any chest pain. He's looking fine. And uh, he's got acute cholecystitis. And sure enough, that's exactly what he had. So fever is a big trigger uh, of ST segment elevation. The other big trigger that's modifiable is, is alcohol. So we do counsel our Brigada patients never to drink more than one or two drinks, standard drinks in a day. Uh, because, you know, binge drinking, high volume drinking uh, can really uh, take these ST segments up quite quickly. Um, and, you know, the degree of ST elevation is correlated with the risk of arrhythmia. And that's probably why the type 3 pattern really doesn't have an arrhythmic risk because they're correlated. Finally, there's drugs. And, you know, there aren't that many drugs you're going to run into in real life that will provoke a brigada. I mean, there are debates around certain drugs like propofol that are commonly used for surgery, might make it a little bit worse, but we usually don't say avoid propofol. But drugs like uh, procainamide, for example, that might be given in the ER for atrial fibrillation can definitely bring this out. In fact, we have procainamide stress testing that we do to unmask that. So we'll take a person with a type 2 or 3 ECG where we have a very high index of suspicion, usually a positive family member, and we'll infuse a gram of procainamide to see if we can have a provoked uh, type 1 pattern. So uh, we talk in the business about spontaneous type 1 patterns, like you see here on the left, or provoked, meaning you had something like this, you get procainamide or ashmaline, and you get something like this. So it's, uh, you know, that's that's, you know, if you want to stop here, that's the nuts and bolts of, of Brigada syndrome in about 14 minutes. So it uh, depends where you put the electrodes. The pattern can come and go. It can change between types one, two, and three. And then, of course, you have all these uh, triggers uh, that you may have. And if you want, I mean, I can send you guys this, this uh, slide deck because it has the actual criteria for type one, two, and three. Uh, it's just a matter of getting to know them, and uh, and you can uh, you can apply them pretty pretty easily. But you have the the coved configuration, like this kind of tombstoney thing, versus the saddleback for these others. And then, as I said, the uh, the ST segments, you know, less than or equal to, or sorry, greater than or equal to, or less than one millimeter, being the break point here between uh, uh, types two and three and make sure to not count this, the J point, which is, you know, in any of these conditions is at least two millimeters high. So that's the, you know, the J point elevation of the incomplete right bundle branch box. So that's that's probably the, the money slide in terms of what you need to know. So high placement, as I said, increases sensitivity, but lower specificity. A real good trick when you're dealing with a Brigada ECG, right, is if you think you see it, and it's a young person, and there's also first degree AV block, which would be funny in a young person. That's yeah, that's the mixed phenotype of the sodium channel mutation. And so, I would say uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of Brigada patients also have a first degree AV block, uh, and that's helpful. The other thing they might have is some fractionation of their QRS, usually in the terminal part. So these high frequency fractionations in the last part of their QRS. We call that an FQRS, and that's also prognostic. But in terms of what uh, the outcome is, these are just ECG patients like in your labs, 1,100 patients 
uh, and those with, uh, we're looking at the predictors of sudden death, which had an overall risk of one and a half percent per year, which is very low, right? Uh, but if you had a history of syncope, if you had a spontaneous type one pattern, it was both fourfold increased risk. If you had like Our Lady in the first case, the repolarization changes not just in V1, V2, but in the inferior leads, uh, that was a three and a half times risk. And uh, if you have a type one pattern down there, that's an additional two times. So, you know, the more ST solvent, the more broadly you see ST segment elevation, uh, the more risk that there is. And here's just another example um, of a type one pattern, again, with that coved type appearance. QRS here looks clean. I don't see any fractionation in it. And if you look down to the interior inferior leads, you see a little bit of early repolarization. I'm not sure I'd call that on my own if I saw just that, uh, but the, the other telltale here is the long first gravy block. And this is a uh, uh, fairly uh, typical Brigada ECG when you see those things together. Uh, procainamide, we mentioned it, uh, how you take here a type three pattern. Here you're pushing it into maybe a type two pattern. I would not call this a, a positive test, but as you give more procainamide, things, uh, things will uh, evolve if there is something to be found. And so this is where we, you know, when we take a person with unexplained cardiac arrest, we do all these tests. Uh, and then when we get down here, procainamide challenge testing uh, can be useful if you can induce a type one pattern with drug. So um, this is the result. And so here you can see uh, the particular mutation in the case that I showed you, uh, which is a, um, uh, a mutation. It's, it's actually a, a deletion mm -hmm. mutation where we're missing a big chunk of a gene. Uh, so obviously uh, likely to be more causal of uh, disease. It is, in fact, the very same gene that causes type 3 long QT. So that's the other thing I didn't mention, how you can have a mutation in this one gene and, and it can present like Brigada in one person and another person present like a, a long QT type 3. So uh, it has to do with the chronic leaking of sodium, right? It, it's, you know, so, you know, when a cell depolarizes, uh, you get uh, prolongation of the QT um, by either reduced potassium currents or increased leaking of sodium currents and that's how that works uh, both ways. So uh, this is a strongly uh, positive gene. It's a major disruption to the sodium channel and uh, almost certainly uh, in this case is the cause of this lady's ventricular fibrillation. Um, so that's Brigada in 20 minutes. Um, it's, it's out there, you'll see it. Uh, don't overcall it uh, when you're talking about type 3 and type 2 patterns, uh, but do be aware of the variability of it and the importance of uh, correct lead placement for, for making it. So uh, I'm back, the slides are down, and we can do some questions and answers if you'd like. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jeff. That was fantastic. Uh, really appreciate that. I know the team might have some questions. I, I have a couple of questions. So. The inheritance pattern, can you tell us a little bit uh, about the, the inheritance pattern? Yeah, it's very simple. Autosomal dominant. You need one copy and uh, you can get it from either parent, not sex linked either. So it's just straight up autosomal dominant. So if your mom or dad has it, you have a 50-50 chance. Okay. Now the and penetrance of it is not complete. So again, mm -hmm. depending on the specific gene, uh, the penetrance is not necessarily complete. Um, the interesting thing is that 69-year-old lady, um, that family is large and their family all has different expressions of this gene. And ironically, I, when I was doing the family screening, I dug up a chart from Stu Connolly from like 25 years ago where he saw her son for atrial flutter. And over the course of atrial flutter, he developed a complete heart block and got a pacemaker. And, uh, you know, that, you know, this was before Brigada syndrome was even described, in all fairness to Stu. And uh, when I got the hard archive of that old paper chart, uh, there sure as heck, there was a type one Brigada ECG done in like 1987 uh, of this uh, son of hers, uh, who had been treated by, by the time I saw the mother, he'd been treated for 15, 20 years for atrial flutter and heart block. So, and never had a cardiac arrest and still hasn't had a cardiac arrest. 
Um, so uh, whereas the mother was asymptomatic till she was 69 years old and then shows up with a very uh, aggressive BT storm. So the, the first degree AV block uh, that, that you see with Bergata, it, is it always also associated with the repolarization abnormalities or can you have one without? You can have it with, you can have it without. And again, the first degree AV block tends to stay there, uh, whereas the ST segments can come and go. Okay. And, and it, just like in the long QT form, long QT3, the QT prolongation can come and go as well. Okay. And in, in young people, for example, you we when they present with with complete heart block and things like that, we start thinking about you know looking for for sarcoid and other conditions like that. Is this something we should be thinking about in young people that that present with with heart block that they could have? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, it, it's going to be a low probability, right? But if there's okay. other story, I mean, for example, something like myotonic dystrophy would be much more common in this part of the world uh, as a cause of unexplained heart block in a young person. But this will fit the list. You're mm -hmm. usually going to twig into it uh, when you see the Brigada changes um, or, or get a very established family history by taking a family history. Yeah. Can you, do you typically do Brigada leaves when you see someone with that are young first degree then? Yeah, I'll do them in two circumstances. One, when I have a young person with an unexplained cardiac arrest uh, or second uh, family screening uh, mm -hmm. for gene negative Brigada. The problem with doing it more widely, as I said, is if, if you do your next thousand ECGs with high leads, you're going to diagnose about 50 cases of Brigada syndrome. And, and most of them aren't real. Hmm. Okay. And when it is inherited, is the, the pattern inherited in the same manner, uh, Jeff? So if they have a Brigada type one and it's inherited no, down? No, not at all. And people shift frequently, like you, you, people will walk through all the different types of patterns and that's why it's a sampling thing. So if you do multiple ECGs and there's only ever a type three pattern, well, that's it. But you know, if you have a patient with syncope and they have a type three ECG, you might order 10 ECGs over the course of a month and to see if there's an intermittent type one pattern. Uh, you know, if you have a good V lead holter, you can do that. We just don't tend to use the augmented unipolar uh, Holter modern, but such tech does exist, right? Mm -hmm. So there, you know, there's uh, you know, like Holter vests and stuff like that you can wear that have, you know, uh, the whole array of, of chest leads or even like 50 or 80 or 100 chest leads, right? So that they use for surf body surface mapping. So um, it's, uh, you know, technology exists, but in our usual technology, you don't, uh, you don't, you wouldn't see this on a Holter unless, you know, because it's only rare that it involves the inferior leads. It's usually V1 and V2. So holters, you tend not to see it. If you see transient SK elevation on a holter, it's either you know coronary disease or spasm mm -hmm. uh, are the two things that usually would cause that. So in a young person, if they present with, with syncope and you see a, a type three type pattern, what would you say, is that somebody that, you know, that uh, in the community we should just do multiple ECGs over time or is that someone? Yeah, that I'd preface that by Shaker by saying if they had worrisome syncope, like if someone has vasovagal and type 3 patterns, like forget it, like, you know, it's non-prognostic and I quote them the whole bit about the uh, insurance company, even if they're doctor, another doctor sent them to me with, hey, query Brigada. If it's sudden syncope, yeah, then game on. Uh, we'll do multiple ECGs. Uh, we might do a procanamide challenge. We might do a, uh, just empiric genetic testing as well. But uh, again, you know, Mike Ackerman, who's the genetic guy at the Mayo Clinic, you know, he you know, says we talk out of both sides of our mouth. On one hand, we ask non-genetic experts to try and diagnose all this. Don't miss this. But then whine about the fact that our clinics are full. You know, uh, and I also share Mike's experience in the, my genetic clinic. I undiagnosed as many genetic conditions as I diagnosed. Uh, and, you know, undiagnosing is actually a lot harder. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't do that just blanket shaker. But if it was a concerning story of saying it be like young guy was walking the dog and then face planted and broke his nose. Yeah, I'd probably do it. Right. Okay. Um and uh, you mentioned that, that there were higher rates of, of atrial arrhythmias, including atrial fib. Um, is that 
you know, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Is that is there any anything specific about that? Uh, does it change our approach to, to AF management in that setting? Uh, well, I certainly don't use procanamide. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, you know, it's one of the causes of familial AFib. It's one of the causes of familial bundle branch block. You know, because they're all dependent on the sodium channel. Um, there is even, you know, some degree of a cardiomyopathy that sets up with, you know, so sodium channel is on the cardiomyopathy panel because some people that have a cardiomyopathy um, don't want to get into it too deeply, but there is like people who try to ablate the right ventricle as a treatment for Brigada uh, to reduce the, the heterogeneity of the repolarization abnormality. And especially in people that have this little fractionation on their ECG in the chest leads, uh, we think that's actually bits of scar that forms in the right ventricle. Um, so it's a, a very complex pathophysiology here about how this uh, sodium channel mutation leads to disease. Uh, but in terms of the AFib, you treat it otherwise the same. You avoid brigada provoking drugs like procainamide, quinidine. But uh, actually quinidine is the opposite. Even though it's very similar to uh, procainamide, quinidine is like a magic bullet for brigada. Like when we have a person with Brigada and VT Storm, we give them quinidine. And, uh, you know, the big trick, trick with quinidine is actually getting a hold of it because it's hard to get sometimes. Yeah. And so so how does that work, you know, Jeff? Because I'm surprised by that, that, that uh, yeah, I would have thought the two drugs, you know, would behave similarly. Yeah, you would think, but, uh, you know, there's just, you know, the Vaughn Williams classification is, you know, fairly complex but it doesn't even capture the fullness of, of why you know for the same reason why doesn't amiodarone cause torsad very often right even though it clearly prolongs the qt massively right but it's it's the relative balance is what i can say you know so you know long qt if you give sodium channel blockade with a class 1b uh intravenously that is sometimes helpful for shutting down a really bad case of vt storm and, and i think it's the the relative sodium channel blocking versus potassium channel blocking. And of course, all these drugs are dialed in slightly differently. So I think it's uh, the difference between procainamide and quinidine is just the balance. Um, and they're, they're also, it's more complicated. There's subunits that they block and different that, you know, the different drugs are active for more, you know, how they do patch clamping and they, they measure specific voltage currents, uh, you know, so they, they have different effects on the different voltages. and. You know, there are dozens of channels that uh, are blocked by these drugs uh, to more or less extent. So it's, it's, that, that's the short answer. It's, it's the precise way it blocks multiple channels at the same time. Uh, one of the nurses, Chris, has got a question. Chris, what were you asking? So Chris was asking about the epigenetic factors that, that might uh, bring out or, or suppress this. Is there uh, descriptors around that, Jeff? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, just to be clear, I'm, I'm sure you're clear on the question. Um, you know, there are environmental influencing factors like fever and, um, and uh, alcohol, uh, but there's epigenetics, which is more how the gene gets expressed, right? Um, so the, uh, the classic example is how, you, you know, you have bees, right? And, you know, there's only one queen and what's the difference, gen the genetic difference between the queen and all the other females is nothing. They have the exact same DNA. So one's, why is one big? Uh, cause they eat this royal jelly, this stuff that, that is produced and in the hive and then it turns on uh, a certain expression of, of a gene that they all have, you know, so. But this is not what alcohol and fever are. Those are environmental influencers. They're actually affecting the function directly of the sodium channel that is expressed rather than the expression of the channel. So um, in some ways we use it like viral illness, right? You know, it's kind of a smoke screen to explain how we can have such funny patterns of inheritance and, and you know, where we don't know all the genes because this, you know, why would you have a Brigada syndrome that looks perfectly Brigada and has no sodium channel mutation that you observe? And, and so we, we, we are starting to get better at understanding these gene-gene interactions and, and uh, epigenetic phenomena as we get bigger and bigger databases. But we're limited just by sheer numbers, right? Like, you know, these are rare, rare mutations. And, uh, you know, there just aren't enough people on the earth to really have the statistical power to understand them is the real answer.
so so far there's been uh, nothing that you say you know, kind of not so much triggering uh, you know, the actual event like fevers and things, but more that can cause gene expression. So people when they're you know, when they're younger or youth and things that that uh, over time uh, brings this out. Is yeah, there there, we think there is Shekhar, We just don't know what it is. What it is? Okay, got it. I have a question. Yeah. Um, is there any relationship between like antipsychotics or Zofran with QT prolongation um, in Rosetta? Like yeah, so various, you know, antipsychotics are some that can show up on the naughty list for Brigada, for sure. Um, you know, the other one that, you know, probably the most two commonly asked interactions, which I have a wishy-washy answer, which is probably safe to use them, but there may be case-by-case uh, -case effects are propofol because it's so widely used, and cannabis. Um, you know, we, we tell our hardcore Brigada patients not to smoke pot um, because it can it can bring out this uh, this phenotype but antipsychotics is a, is a big category uh, where there are interactions uh, brigadadrugs.org is the best best approach I don't even keep them all in my head to be honest because uh, there there are so many and so many of those drugs that you don't use and they sound sort of abusive. I've not devoted a lot of time to uh, understanding that but you know, QTDrugs.org, BrigadaDrugs.org, CredibleMeds.org, they're all good sources. In fact, I think they've started to consolidate, uh, but they're all good sources in terms of finding out if a drug is is potentially interfering or not. It'll show you case reports and things like that. Perfect. And so, um, just to round out for the team, so if there is a, a type 1 and they've had an arrhythmic event, um, can you just sort of summarize what you guys would do at that point and, and you know, yeah. what? So if I have a person with a spontaneous type 1 pattern, okay, just you're doing a random ECG for a physical or an insurance thing and you get a spontaneous type 1 pattern. Okay, I say, yes, that's Brigada. You have not only a type 1 pattern, but this is Brigada syndrome, right? Um, you have a 1.5% chance per year of dropping dead, which, by the way, is far below our threshold risk for implanting ICDs and people have had heart attacks. That being said, we're often dealing with younger people, so the tolerance of risk tends to be lower. But the default for me in an asymptomatic person is I don't necessarily give them a defibrillator. I tell them, listen, you've got this, get a medical or bracelet, here's what to avoid for drugs, and you know, make sure you always go to a pharmacist and, and have this on your file tell them not to drink more than one or two in a 24-hour period and I tell them to treat their fever aggressively with Tylenol and if they're okay with that that's I just follow them do Holters periodically ECGs periodically but I just follow them like that um, if they're more anxious there's been a sudden death in the family which is not necessarily predictive of them dying suddenly but it's certainly predictive of how they want to be treated uh, then we do put in prophylactic ICDs uh, and they go off just like in long QT3, uh, they go off at a shockingly low rate. Like they, 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 they don't often you, you, you know, take 100 people with Brigada syndrome and ICD and they're not getting a lot of shocks. But periodically, uh, you know, they'll get a lot of shocks. Like they'll, they'll go 10 years with nothing and then they'll have like 10 shocks in an afternoon. Um, and it, you know, something that, that tipped them off. So, so type ones that are just found uh, on a routine ECG. Um, they, yeah, they definitely need to go to a genetic arrhythmia clinic. There needs to be family screening. There there needs to be, at the bare minimum, my three pack of, of kind of conservative measurements, drug, alcohol, and fever avoidance. And uh, uh, Jason Roberts and the team there uh, for genetic counseling, is that uh, where uh, that that's going or where? Yeah, where so yeah, Jason and I, and we have a genetic counselor as well, have, a, have an integrated genetic clinic. Perfect. Um, and uh, and then they would handle all of the, the familial the screening as well, Jeff? Yeah, or it could be a combination, right? For out-of-towners that don't want to make the trip, um, you know, we can, you know, we can do video or have our colleagues like yourself do the uh, screening and if it's a matter of a, a genetic positive case well then that becomes very easy we just uh, you know ship the the blood kits and, and uh, we'll get the genetic test back in about three months and then we know 
And you mentioned um, that uh, a family history of, of uh, sudden death doesn't necessarily tip things over, like up and, and you know, Holcombs and things. So it uh, sudden death does not change. Uh, well, yes and no. It, it's not a special risk in Brigada, but it's a general risk in the population, right? Forget yeah. Brigada, Lanky G, just take a, a million people out of a province. Uh, if you have a first degree relative that's died suddenly, you're at threefold increased risk of dying suddenly, but threefold background risk, so it's a tiny, tiny number. If you have two, two first degree relatives who die suddenly, you have a seven times increased risk of sudden death. So sudden death is heritable in general, um, and but it just doesn't, you know, the risk ratios in Brigada, I showed you the, the multivariate model there, it just doesn't fall out as a significant predictor. So it's not, you know, in you know, it adds a little bit, but it's it's not really one of the key things. Like we don't say, oh, no one in your family's died, so don't worry about it, right? And is there anything uh, structurally you see on echo and things? Do they do they over time develop atrial myopathies? Is there any? Yeah, they can develop atrial myopathy, shaker. They can develop RV enlargement sometimes. That's usually about it. Um, you know, there are rare cases of sodium channel mutations that get full blown dilated five ventricular dilated cardiomyopathy. You're not sort of routinely uh, monitoring uh, LV function or anything like that in people? With not really, cancer? not really. We do it from time to time, but not really. Not There's no routine pattern for that. Like and everyone, you know, who would come in through an initial workup for Brigada is going to get an echo at the course, start. Yeah. But we're not doing annual surveillance echoes or anything like that. We just don't see it develop so much. When we see cardiomyopathy, uh, they usually present with cardiomyopathy, not with electrical mischief, and then develop a cardio. Like that's true of something like, say, Team M43 or Newfoundland ARBC. They present mm -hmm. with BF, uh, and then they get a cardiomyopathy about 20 years later. So we do follow that genetic syndrome uh, that way. But Brigada, you know, it's kind of funny. They they usually, if they're going to have bundle branch blocker cardiomyopathy, you usually see that on the presentation, and you don't usually see that develop. At least I've never seen it develop. And any role for sending these people for CMR, cardiac MRI, or do you do any other imaging? Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't do it routinely. Uh, we're kind of, we, we risk stratify our CMR just because access is such a problem in the mm -hmm. province. Uh, so we don't gum up the works with a lot of this low yield stuff. It's more interesting, uh, you know, from a research point of view, but it really doesn't affect management on a practical level. Any other uh, questions, uh, guys? Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for uh, taking the time out at lunch and really appreciate it and being on call. Uh, making the nice time to see us. everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Okay, take care.